uh, part two of a part two of a two-part series on spiritual warfare. So uh, last week's message focused on a passage of scripture from the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Uh, let me read that right quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. It says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And so uh, our focus there was on strongholds. And we simply define strongholds as things uh, that represent the arguments, the thoughts, and the plans that are contrary to and in opposition to the thoughts and, and, and plans that God has for us. They are fortresses. That's the definition of a stronghold, is a fortress. And they are fortresses that Satan wants to build in our lives to keep God out and to keep us enslaved to him. And so we talked about things that we can do to pull down strongholds. And so that was kind of the situation there. Now, um, who are the kids that were in Sunday school this morning? Caden, you want to answer any of the questions? Who? Okay. Um, well, who taught? Linda? I'm going to ask you. Oh, there we go. Okay, we're going to, the scripture says that we're going to be looking at this morning, says, well, from, from last, actually, the scripture from last week talked about the weapons that w of our warfare. And then today we're going to talk about the armor, uh, the armor of God. And there are six pieces to the armor of God. Can you tell me what they are? What are the six pieces? Pardon? You don't have to say all of them, but let's see what we can do, okay? Hand her a microphone. Somebody hand her a microphone. I want you to say it nice and, nice and loud. This will be kind of a prelude to what we're talking about today. Here we go. Um, there's the feet of peace. The what? The feet of peace. Okay, we have our peace. feet shod with the gospel of peace. What else? The belt of truth. The what? Belt of truth. The belt of truth, okay. Um, the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. The shield of what? The shield of what? Remember? Okay. Okay, we have the loin belt of truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have our feet shod, or have our peace, I call them the peace shoes. We have our peace shoes on, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and then prayer. Okay? Well, pretty good. You did, you, you did fine. You have your hand. So, today I want us to look at the, the weapons of our warfare. And weapons that are mighty that are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And before I do that, uh, let me repeat what I said last week regarding spiritual warfare. And this is so important. I don't want us to miss this. And I mentioned last week I didn't want us to miss it. And although spiritual warfare is real, and we, we can't ignore it, it, it happens. We, we got to be careful 
to remember that the real battle with Satan was won at the cross and on the resurrection on the resurrection day. Okay? And this same victorious Christ who single-handedly, single-handedly defeated the devil lives in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay? God the Father sent His Son, J-E-S-U-S, and He died for everyone, J-E-S-U-S. Anyhow, the, the thing is, God sent His Son to save the world. And so, God the Father sent His Son, and, and the, God the Son's name was Jesus, and then Jesus died, was buried, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, and then He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you without a defense. And I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. And that was done on the day of Pentecost. And so, and then the Holy Spirit indwells us. So that same power, that same victorious Christ, who, who single-handedly beat upon the devil on the cross, is, is the, same, uh, the same God now who indwells us. As, as God the Holy Spirit. That's why I mentioned last week that John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 4 verse 4 says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay? And our view, our view of spiritual warfare, there's a lot of stuff out there on spiritual warfare. Unfortunately, a lot of it is a bunch of garbage. Because what takes place is, and, and Pastor will cash in with me on this 100%. What takes place is a lot of these books and a lot of these preachers are saying that we, we, we have to take on the enemy. And how many, how many, um, how many preachers do you know that will say, you've you, you got to talk to the devil? I don't find that in Scripture. See? Jesus didn't say, when his disciples said, teach us to pray, Jesus didn't say, uh, our, our Father Satan. No, our Father who art in heaven. See? So, so Michael the archangel, uh, he wouldn't even take on Satan. He committed to that, that taking on, if you will, to, to Jesus Christ. And so our view of spiritual warfare must begin with this basic understanding of the fact that Jesus already accomplished victory over Satan on the cross. And then when he died and rose again, that accomplished the defeat. And if we do not start out with this as our foundation, eventually, you can count it, we're going to be led to, into utterly ridiculous spiritual conclusions like a lot of these preachers have done and a lot of these book writers. And the victory has already been won, okay? There, there is nothing that we can add to the destructive work Jesus did to Satan's domain when he was raised from the dead. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross and as he was breathing his last breath as a human being on this earth, when he, when he hollered, it is finished, what did that mean? It is finished. Salvation's plan was handled. So let's look at the weapons of our warfare. And like we mentioned earlier, there, there are seven of them. A lot of, a lot of Bible expositors teach that there's only six. But I've always taught, and I've been at this for many years, I, I've always taught that there's seven. The loin belt of truth, number one. The breastplate of righteousness, number two. The gospel of peace, Number three, number four, the shield of faith. Number five, the helmet of salvation. Number six, the sword of the Spirit. And lastly, number seven, prayer. Now, let's look at them individually. The loin belt of truth. Now, a lot of years ago, initially, uh, I initially thought that the loin belt must have been a beautiful weapon. Uh, like the others listed in, in, in the text. But the loin belt was the least attractive the least noticeable, and the most boring piece of armor that the Roman soldier wore. Now, you might ask, why does Paul use this imagery of the soldier and the armor that he has on? Paul spent a lot of his lifetime in ministry in prison. 
and you've heard me say and, and maybe others say that when Paul when Paul went into a city, of course he wanted to plant a church, but when Paul went into a city, there were two places he checked out. He checked out the local synagogue, if there was one, and he and he and he checked out the local jail. Because he knew if he preached in the synagogue, sooner or later he was going to get arrested and wind up in the clink. See? And so he, I, I, I'm just convinced he checked those places out. He met somebody and said, can you take me to the jail or tell me what it's like? What, what are the facilities there? How many guards they got? So, um, so then he, all those years and months that he spent chained to a soldier, Paul was very practical. And it's like, he says, I have learned that whatsoever state I'm in, I'm going to be content. And so... Um, I don't know how, how you look at stuff, but most of the stuff that takes place in my life uh, form, form the outline for, for a message that I can preach or teach, see? And, and so Paul says, Paul is thinking probably, what kind, what kind of a message can, can I put together? What can I learn from this? So he's looking at, this, at these soldiers, and he comes up with, the armor of God and then he draws some comparisons and so so when a Roman soldier was wearing his beautiful breastplate of brass who was going to notice the belt and if you were to describe a man's clothing would you begin with the belt you can't even see mine if I didn't have this sweatshirt on you still couldn't see it see because sometimes our belly hangs out my three year old great grandson and we took care of him last night and he's sitting on my lap and he goes he starts hitting me and he goes papa you got a big belly and i said well yeah and it's all mine see and so if you were to describe a man's clothing you wouldn't begin with the belt and you can hardly even see it and you you would probably start out by describing his jacket then you move to his shirt his necktie and even his shoes but you wouldn't begin with the belt would you Okay, your belt seems to be a significant little thing until you take it off. Until you take it off. Then you discover how important that belt really is. Take it off and your pants might start falling down. And as your pants fall down, your shirt comes untucked. And if you've lost your pants and your shirt has come untucked, you look like a mess. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so graphic there, but I just was thinking about that. Uh, it's easy to fall apart when you don't have your belt on. And you'll spend most of your time trying to keep your pants pulled up. I, I get a kick. I go to the mall. I love to watch people. And, and some of these kids, you know, they wear those pants that are, that are down. And sometimes they have a belt. I, I, I wonder, why do they even have a belt? Because it doesn't hold their pants up. See, they use their hands and they walk around, you know, and if they start talking with their hands, their pants fall down. Crazy. Too graphic. Okay, too much information. All right. You, you'll spend most of the time pulling up your pants. You won't feel very confident and you certainly won't, <laughs> you certainly don't want to make any fast moves. And see, that's precisely what the, loin belt did for the Roman soldier. It held all the pieces of his armor together. He might be wearing all his great weaponry, but if his, if his loin belt was not in place, everything would fall apart. And thus it was said that the loin belt was the most vital part of all the weaponry the Roman soldier wore. Now, listen to this. I'll get to you in a minute. The Ro for example, the Roman soldier's shield was attached to the loin belt. If he had no loin belt, he had no resting place for the massive shield. If he had no loin belt, he had no place to hang his sword. If there was no loin belt, there was nothing for his lance to rest upon. If he didn't have a loin belt, there was nothing to keep his breastplate from flapping in the wind. The loin belt held it all together. The soldier's armory would, would literally fall apart. And the loin belt, by application now, the loin belt of truth is what? 
the Word of God. It's the only spiritual weapon that has taken on a physical, natural form and has passed tangibly from the spirit realm into our hands. It's the most important piece of weaponry that we possess. God is making a point here. And in the mind of, of Paul, I think he caught this. He's saying that the piece of armor that is in the middle of the man is the most important weapon to the man. If you take off that weapon, the man will fall apart or the woman will fall apart. Likewise, folks, when you ignore the word of God and cease to apply it to your life on a daily basis, you have willingly chosen to let your entire spiritual life come apart at the seams. You cannot... You cannot function without the loin belt of truth, which is the word of God. Diana, you had a question. It's also didn't they use it to, um, because their uniforms were like dresses and they pulled them up. And it said that they could move about better. Yeah. And get them out of the way because they were long. And, and when they went into war, they said they girded them up and they just picked them up and found them. It just, you know, the, it helped them to gird up or hold up yeah. stuff. Um, several years ago when I was at the We Out Church actually I had already gone out to Shelter Cove but I was committed to preaching a message to at the We Out Church where I had gone for many years <clears throat> and so I was preaching I was rolling right along and all of a sudden my Bible fell apart and it just flew out of my hands and papers went everywhere and the, and the kids were sitting in the First couple of rolls, they were scrambling and pick up pieces of my Bible and everything. I said, "Good grief, my Bible's falling apart." And I picked it up and just and just tried to gather myself together. Fortunately, I'd I'd rehearsed my message, so it didn't harm my message that much. But on the way out of church, one of the older ladies in the church handed me a slip of paper, it was about four inches square, and on it she had written this: "A Bible that's falling apart probably belongs to someone who's not." I can identify with that, you know. And, and the Bible just holds us together. The Bible is our loin battle of truth. And so that being said then, as Paul continues in Ephesians 6, he reveals to us the next piece of our spiritual weaponry. He says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, uh, in order to understand why Paul calls... Uh, righteousness a breastplate in his list of spiritual armor we got to understand uh, what Paul had in mind has he has he thought of the of the Romans soldiers breastplate are you are you with me so far am I going too fast or whatever we good we good the breastplate was the shiniest most beautiful beautiful and most glamorous glamorous piece of uh, weaponry weaponry that the Roman soldier possessed and when people walked up to a Roman soldier, they certainly didn't notice his loin belt first. They didn't even notice his shoes or his sword, perhaps. And as conspicuous as the soldier's helmet was, and we'll get to that in a minute, and sometimes they, they wore funny things on their helmet, the piece of armor that immediately caught the attention of onlookers was not his helmet, but his large, shiny, gorgeous breastplate. And the first thing a person would notice when looking at a Roman soldier was his beautiful breastplate. Now let me share this with you. The breastplate began at the top of his neck and went all the way down to the knees. It was composed of two different pieces of metal. One piece of metal went down the front and the other went down the back. Now, let me mention something here. Most of the stuff you read and most of the preachers who share that I've heard down through the years share about the armor of God said there was no armor for the back because God did not want us to retreat. That is not true. Because you see, the, the, the breastplate, two pieces covered the front, covered the back. Okay? And these two pieces of metal were held together by solid brass rings 
on top of the shoulders. And quite often these larger sheets of metal that covered the front and back of the man were comprised of smaller scale-like pieces of metal, metal similar to the scales of fish. And it was the heaviest part of the armor. And at times it, it weighed in excess of 40 pounds. And you may recall, some of you who, who remember Goliath, Goliath's breast, breastplate weighed approximately 125 pounds. Of course, Goliath was a big man. And it was, the breastplate was extremely elaborate and beautiful. It was made either of bronze or brass, usually brass. And I want you to catch this now. The more Roman soldiers wore their breastplates as they walked and marched, something incredible happened. Listen to this. When you rub two shiny pieces of metal against each other for a long time, what happens? They shine. They begin to add a luster to each other. And these pieces of metal may have started out shiny, but this new luster makes them shine even brighter. And this is exactly what happened when the Roman soldier walked around with his breastplate on. Those smaller scale-like pieces of metal would rub against each other, thus causing each piece to develop a beautiful luster. And in addition, brass is a golden color that shines and it sparkles. And when it is out in the sun, especially if it's a fine piece of brass. Therefore, when the fully armed soldier went outside on a sunny day, the rays of the sun would reflect off his breastplate, create a dazzling spectacle, and sometimes uh, blind people that looked on it. Now, as the Roman soldier walked around, this breastplate of what Paul calls the breastplate of righteousness grew shinier and shiny and shinier. Here's the application. The more you wear, get this now, don't miss this. The more you wear your breastplate of righteousness, walking through life fully consciousness of your righteousness in Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is our righteousness. And the more you wear your breastplate of righteousness, walking through life fully conscious of your righteousness in Christ, the more brightly you will shine as a light in a dark world. You got that? Isn't that neat? Isn't that kind of neat? I think so. Next one. Verse 15. Shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, the Roman... Soldiers' shoes, they, they weren't ordinary shoes. In the fir first place, they were made out of bronze or brass, usually brass. And the, and the shoes were, were uh, primarily composed of two parts. The greave, I'll tell you what that is in a minute, and then the shoe itself. And they were exceptionally dangerous to anybody, to any folk. The greave was a tube-like piece of bronze or brass that began at the top of the knee and extended down past the lower leg, finally resting on the upper portion of the foot. You got that picture in your mind? It was made from a warped sheet of beautifully tooled metal that had been spe specifically formed to fit around the calf of the particular Roman soldier's leg. And as we stated Earlier, this tube-like piece of metal caused the Roman soldier's shoes to look like boots that were made of brass. So it was, they were so closely entwined there. And the shoe itself was made of two pieces of metal. On the top and, 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 and bottom, the foot was covered with fine pieces of brass. The sides of the shoe were held together by multiple pieces of durable leather, very tightly wound. And on the bottom, these shoes were equipped, now catch this, with ex were, these shoes were equipped with extremely dangerous spikes that were one or more inches long. Most of the time, they're about three inches long. And if a soldier was involved in active combat, his spikes could have been close to three inches long. And I'll tell you what, in today's terminology, those were killer shoes. Huh? <laughs> literally, literally. 
Pardon? It wasn't designed to be comfortable. The armor of God at times is not comfortable. It's not. That's why a lot of people don't put it on. Okay? Because it's not comfortable. They don't put on. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. Something that we put on. Be clothed with the whole armor of God. My good friend Lance Anderson, his sister, Lenny, for years shared that one of the first things she did in the morning when she got up, she, she figuratively in her mind put on the armor of God. Just put it on. Paul had these very shoes in mind as he's looking. He says, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And when you realize what these shoes look like and how dangerous those sharpened spikes could be, you begin to understand why it's so amazing that Paul would use this illustration to describe peace. According to Paul's peace, according to Paul, peace is an awesome weapon. Both defensive and offensive. Peace not only protects you, but also provides you with a brutal weapon. Get this now. To, well, to wield against the enemy when he attacks. If you use the weapon of peace correctly, it will keep spiritual force foes where they belong, under your feet. Under your feet. One good kick and the enemy's strategies against you will be crushed. See? Mm. Peace gives us a foundation so secure that we can step out on confident faith without being moved by what we see or what we hear. Confidence. So then, after mentioning the weapon of peace, then Paul immediately turns to the next item, the shield of faith. And he says, above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, Roman soldiers owned two... I'm doing okay. Roman soldiers owned two kinds of shields. They used one in public parades and ceremonies and the other in battle. The, the first shield that they used in, in public parades was a small round shield that was primarily a decorative piece of equipment to be used in public ceremonies and parades, just kind of for show. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was decorated with all kinds of intricate etchings and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the second kind of shield used by the Roman soldier was the one to which Paul makes reference to here. And this large battle shield was the very opposite of the first. And the first one was much too small to protect a soldier from the slings and arrows of his adversary. And the smaller shield never would have covered a soldier in the midst of battle. And although beautiful and enjoyable to behold in public ceremonies and parades, such a small piece of armor would have left the soldier uh, wide open, open to deadly blows. Now, on the other hand, the second shield completely covered the man. Completely covered the man. Now catch this. Romans 12.3 says this. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. How much faith has God given you? He has given you... Catch this now. He has given you enough faith to make certain you are covered in life. And when God tells you, put on the whole armor of God... And one of those pieces is the shield of faith. It's going to be a shield that's going to protect you. If God gives it to you, it'll protect you. Don't ever worry or fret that God has given others more faith than he has given you. Keep track of your own self. We spend so much doggone time worrying about somebody else. That we don't worry about ourselves. See? I remember 
talking to people about Christ when I first became a Christian. And a question that always, it, it hasn't come up hardly at all in the last lot of years that I witnessed to people and I witnessed to a lot of people. But they'd always say, well, what about the, the person in the deepest, darkest part of Africa? How are they going to be reached? And I remember going to the fellow who discipled me with that question. I said, John, I get people asking me this question. John says, well, first of all, it's a smoke screen. But secondly, here's a good answer. He said, let them know that they cannot understand God's love for the, purpose, for the person in the deepest, darkest part of Africa if they haven't understood God's love for them. And once I understand God's love for me, I can understand God's love for other people. See, when God, when we realize what, what Jesus did for us, See, then we can understand or start to understand how he could minister to other people. Mm. Like a wide, long shield of faith God has given you is adequate to cover every need that could ever rise in your life. Keep that in mind. I've had people tell me, Tom, you sure got tremendous faith. Well, I got the shield of faith. And that's part of my armor. Now, in the, more, in the majority of cases, the Roman soldier's shield was composed of multiple layers. Are you liking this so far? Are you learning anything so far? I know I am. Usually, six layers of leather. Thick animal hide that had been tightly woven together. And these layers of animal hide were specially tanned and then woven together so tightly that they became almost as strong as steel. And one piece of leather is tough, but you take, uh, imagine how tough and durable six layers of leather would be. And because the shield of the Roman soldier was made from all these layers of animal hides, it was extremely strong and exceptionally long lasting and hard wearing. However, it had to be taken care of, okay? And our faith is extremely tough and exceptionally durable, uh, more so than sometimes we realize. No matter how hard and how long the enemy beats against our faith, our faith can outlast the attacks if it's nurtured, if it's taken care of. Hmm. And you see, because the, the Roman soldier's shield was made of leather, it was important for the soldier to take good care of it. And although the six layers of animal hide made the shield extremely strong and durable, that tough, thick leather could become stiff and breakable over a period of time if it wasn't taken care of. Therefore, it was necessary for Roman soldiers to know how to care for their shields. And they use two key ingredients, two key things to take care of that shield. Anybody tell me what they were? Oil was one. What was the other? Water. Who said water? Oil and water. Now let me tell you this. A soldier was given a daily schedule for maintaining his shield in excellent condition. And each morning when he woke up, he would reach for his shield and for a small vial of oil. And after saturating a piece of cloth with this heavy ointment, he would thoroughly rub the oil into the leather of the shield to keep it soft and pliable. And for a soldier to ignore this daily application of oil and to let his shield go without the kind of required care was essentially the equivalent of his inviting certain death. Hmm. It would become hard and stiff and the oil would help soften it. So then... Okay, what was the water for? Anybody tell me what the, what the water was for? R Ruthie. Pardon? Yeah. To, to deal with the flaming arrows. Their enemies used arrows that carried fire. And even when those dangerous flaming arrows hit their target, the wet surface of the shields would extinguish them on impact. 
and these water-saturated shields gave the soldier the upper hand in battle with putting out the enemy's fire. Now, listen to this. In the scriptures, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And water is sometimes a symbol of the word. And in the same way, when we keep our faith completely saturated with the oil, ministry of the Holy Spirit, and with the water, the scripture talks, Ephesians 5.26, about the washing of water by the word. Our word, saturated shields, have the power to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the adversary. Isn't that neat? Thank you, Paul, for your observation. Helmet of salvation. The Roman soldier's the Roman soldier's helmet was a fascinating and beautiful part of his armor, and it was a flamboyant piece of weaponry, very visible, very ornate, very in intricate. In fact, it more like looked more like a piece of artwork artwork than a helmet. And rather than being a simple piece of metal formed to fit his head, the Roman soldier's helmet was highly decorated with all kinds of engravings and etchings. And sometimes, depending on the soldier, how, how well they wanted to, to make themselves visible, there were feathers sticking out. You know, if, if one of my, uh, one of the husbands, of, probably both of the husbands of my, Great grand or granddaughters who were married, they'd probably have one of those whirlwinds on top, you know, the whirly bird on top of their helmet. Mm. So, why would the Holy Spirit compare a piece of rep weaponry like this to salvation? Well, it could be. Because your salvation is the most gorgeous, most intricate, most elaborate, and most ornate gift God ever gave you. See that? Tough to beat the gift of salvation. It is. Especially when we understand it's eternal. For God so loved the world. And he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. And by using this example, the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is telling us something very important. When a person is confident of his salvation, and when he is walking in the powerful reality of all that salvation means for him, that person is noticeable. The scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord, what? Say so. Those whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Why did a Roman soldier need a helmet? Because you see, his opponent often carried a short-handled axe called a battle axe. Sometimes we make that reference to our wives, you know, but that wasn't, you know. And when battle axes were used, heads rolled. Because it was short, it could be... Choo. If the Roman soldier didn't have his helmet on when he went out to fight, he could be absolutely certain that he would lose his head. So the Roman helmet was not merely a beautiful piece of weaponry. It was something intended to save a man's head. And that's exactly what salvation will do for you when you wear it like a protective helmet on your head. It guards your mind. It guards your mind. Let this mind be in you which was also in, in, in Christ Jesus. 
and the helmet of salvation. When we, are, we, when we realize we're secure in Christ, it does something to our mind. There's a peace there. There's a peace there. I, I tell this to some people. They don't believe me, but it's absolutely true. I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior late evening, September 1st, 1962, Labor Day weekend. And here I am, how many ever years that's been, down the road. And I've never doubted for one second that I was on my way to heaven. Because the night I got saved, I said, Lord, if I never do another thing in my life, I want to know when I leave this room tonight, I'm, I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Please come into my life and take over. And he came in and took over. And he gave me life and gave me peace. And I've never doubted for one second. I think that's why I have such a peace and joy in my heart. Hmm. That's exactly what salvation will do for you when you wear this helmet of salvation like a protective helmet on your head. On the other hand, if you don't walk in your salvation and all that your salvation entails, uh, you'll, you'll feel the brunt of the enemy's battle axe coming to attack your mind and steal your victory. Quickly. Sword of the Spirit. I love this one. I love this one. There were five different swords that the soldiers used in their confrontations with enemy forces. I'm not going to go into all of, all of them, but, but the sword Paul speaks of here was the most brutal sword of the five. And this brutal weapon of murder was approximately 19 inches long. Both sides of its blade were razor sharp, making this sword much more dangerous than the other four that were only sharp on one side. In, in addition, the tip of the sword turned upward, causing the, the point of the blade to be extremely sharp and deadly. Mm. This two-edged blade, I want you to catch this now. This two-edged blade inflicted a wound far worse than the other swords. And before a Roman soldier withdrew this particular sword from the gut of his enemy, he would hold his sword very tightly with both hands and give it a wrenching twist inside his enemy's stomach. And this would cause the opponent's insides to spill out as the soldier pulled the sword from the enemy's body. Of all the swords available, this one was the most dangerous of all. And although the other swords were deadly, this one was a terror to the imagination. My wife is grimacing as I explained this sword. The sword was not only intended to kill, but it was intended to completely rip an enemy's insides to shreds. It was a weapon of murder. And let me tell you something. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is a deadly weapon in the hands of a believer. The Scripture says, For the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God is sharper than this sword that Paul is describing here. Sharp. Piercing to the dividing asunder of joint and marrow and the intents of the hearts of men. And when the word is preached in power, see, we don't have to defend it. See? What is a lion's best defense? His roar. A lot of times one of our best defenses, one of our strongest weapons is just let the Word of God speak. Just share it. Share it. 
God help the churches, and I've been in them. God help the churches who, who give just a few minutes to the Word of God on Sunday or on Wednesday. We say we're going to get together on Wednesday night for a prayer and Bible study, and we don't do either the way God would have us do it. See? We come to church, and a lot of churches, you, you go to churches, and the service may be maybe 40, 40 minutes long, or 45 minutes long, and they spend all but about 10 or 15 minutes on announcements and stuff like that. Very little is given to the Word of God. See? And what's the Word of God do? It equips us. It equips us. Do you think so far today you're better equipped to, to, to do warfare in God's kingdom? I am. And I've been studying this stuff for years. Hmm. Sword of the Spirit, which is the, the Word of God. And then the final weapon I want to tell you about is not often included, like I mentioned before, when teaching about the whole armor of God. But it's a powerful weapon. Powerful weapon. And that's the weapon of prayer. Have you discovered, even to a, a small extent, what prayer can do in your own life? I have. I'm here this morning because of the prayers of a blind older lady in one of the beach cities in South San Diego County by the name of Aunt Maddie, M-A-D-D-I-E. Aunt Maddie was one of the greatest prayer warriors I'd ever known. I met her, talked to her several times, but, but I wanted to meet this lady, Aunt Maddie, because here's what would happen at the servicemen center where I came to know Christ, Christian Servicemen Center, south of San Diego. We'd come in. We'd be invited off the streets of San Diego. We'd, we'd come in to Harbor Home. It was a, a house, an older house. And uh, we'd sign a guest book. Have some coffee, cookies, cake maybe. And then we'd go in and, and we'd have a, a fun time together, which included a ministry in the Word of God and some singing of, of some neat songs. And so I, I was there that that night, first time I'd ever been out there. But I discovered this later about Aunt Maddie. When the fellows would leave that living room and kitchen area of Harbor Home specifically and go over into the church in the fellowship hall, one of the people in charge there would get on the phone. Aunt Maddie, blind, had a photographic memory. And they would call. And they'd say, here are the guys who are out tonight at this meeting. And they'd name the guys. Tom Colbert. And Aunt Maddie would repeat it. Tom Colbert. Tom Colbert. Then they'd go down. Gordy Benson. Dave English. Go all the way down. And then she'd pray. And God would use her prayers, Aunt Maddie's prayers, to touch. God used Aunt Maddie's prayer, September 1st, 1962, to touch the life of a little snot-nosed serviceman from Myers Flat, California, population 44. That's what said on the sign. Prayer is a powerful thing. Prayer can do anything that God can do. Say that with me. Prayer can do anything that God can do. 
That's why it's important in the armor of God. See? And Paul says, and put on prayer. Pray with all prayer and thanksgiving and supplication. See? The difference between prayer and supplication is this. When you pray and ask blessing upon the meal, that's general prayer. A prayer of supplication would be if you were if you knew the food wasn't all that great. And instead of saying, Lord bless this food, oh Lord bless this food. It doesn't look good at all. That's supplication. Just gut wrenching. More intense than that, even. Mm. So what's the armor of God? The loin belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, feet shod with the gospel of peace. Okay? What else? Come on. Huh? Sword of the Spirit. Amen. Prayer. Put it on. Get up in the morning. Put on the armor of God. 